This conversation is brought to you with the kind compliments of call, that is, the Commonwealth of Learning. Gender inequality must be eradicated, and call is on a mission to help in its obliteration. It has embarked on a project to help young women and girls become motivated to pursue their fields of interest and build the future generation of leaders by launching the Commonwealth Wise Woman Project. This is a mentoring program that links girls from across the Commonwealth with mentors also from across the Commonwealth who are women in leadership roles with a story deserving of emulation. But Call does not stop there. Call is now taking that initiative further by creating this podcast series where I get the opportunity and privilege to interview some of these distinguished women and hear the path they took or the path that took them to leadership. COVID-19 has joined a long list of contributors to gender inequality, including globalization, technology, and climate change. But stay with us through this 10-episode series and hear how women have made their way over and around these hurdles. I am Dr. Anne A. Wallace, a higher education management and e-learning specialist, and I will be your host. Today's episode is titled The Rights to Lead by Miss Elizabeth Kite. Welcome, Miss Kite. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. Now, I would like to introduce our audience to you by reading your brief but very powerful bio. So allow me to look away and read your bio. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth V. Kite is the founding CEO of Take the Lead, formerly known as Tonga Youth Leaders a non-government organization that focuses on empowering underrepresented groups in Tonga to lead in places of national decision-making. Take the Lead runs various leadership programs, including the only annual mock parliament for young women and girls. She leads Fale Alie O Tonga, all of Take the Lead's programs are focused on harnessing the skills and talents of individuals that are often left unheard so that they can lead in confidence and have their voices recognized and heard. Elizabeth also is the Pacific Regional Representative for the Commonwealth Youth Council, the world's largest and most diverse youth group with the council representing the 1.2 billion young people of the Commonwealth. Miss Kite, thank you for taking the time to be with us. You are the youngest person that I have interviewed in this series, and I'm, and I'm very excited about this. You are a very dynamic young lady. You're the founding CEO of Take the Lead in Tonga. You're an entrepreneur and I gather a serial entrepreneur. And it seems you do a lot more than that. So for us to get started, I'd like you to please tell our listeners what you do. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be here, Anne, um, to speak with you and your audience. Um, this is you know, a real honor for me to kind of share more about what it is that I do. And particularly for me, what's important is to um, give more voices uh, from the Pacific, which I think isn't always um, the case. So thank you so much for that. Um, you've covered pretty much everything I do do. Um, it's quite uncomfortable. I don't think it ever gets comfortable talking about yourself, but um, yes, I do run a non-government organization um, mm -hmm. that I'm really proud of because we were the first youth led to be registered as an NGO here in Tonga. And that's actually inspired many more youth initiatives to be um, to be initiated officially. So that's what we do. We focus on leadership um, development here in Tonga, particularly for young people or people from underrepresented groups, including the LGBT and also people living with disabilities. Um, and yes, having their voices amplified and heard by national leaders is something really important to us because often these voices are left unheard. 
Um, and aside from that, I have, you know, dabbled into the private sector. I'm trying to, well, I register Thomas first online um, retailer, which is going to launch soon. And that's really um, exciting for me. And again, that's to help um, uh, female artisans, but also just other underrepresented groups who are talented in this sphere uh, to help them sell their products to a wider market abroad. Um, and yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You, this, is, this is exciting. You are a young person and you sound so very serious and so very focused. You know, I think of many young women and girls who look to contemporary rock stars and movie stars with a seemingly meteoric rise to fame and fortune as their role models. And I wonder, are these the dreams that leaders are made of? Um, it really depends, I think, what you want out of life, what you think, your, what you know your purpose to be or your mission. Um, some people do want fame and they actually serve, you know, others really well when they're famous and they have a wider platform, but some others are more locally focused. Um, so it really is dependent on that. And depending on the individual as well, uh, you know, if they have good morals and good ethics and values, I think that's really important. And it's also, I know, really hard for famous people um, being in these, you know, spotlights, um, in being in the spotlight, it's a hard place to be. So... Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what it is that you want out of life. And I believe, yeah, if the person you're looking up to has good values, a you know, um, belief in faith, um, you, you've got a good person to look up to. <laughs> right. So really what you're telling our girls, it's fine to dream in whatever direction. Good morals Absolutely. and values are important. Yes, that, that definitely. I want to go on a little, a little more serious, if I can be more serious than you are already. But I'd like to go on a little more serious note and make mention of the fact that I'm aware that you experience loss and grief at a very young age. And you know, for some young people, that's a turning point in a downward direction. But that was not the case for you. I'd like you to tell us why you were not derailed. Um, so yeah, it was fun. It's funny thinking about that. Um, it was a big turning point for me when, uh, to, with my faith, I actually stopped uh, believing in uh, my faith. As you know, uh, Tonga is a Christian country. Mm -hmm. And when I experienced that first um, loss of my dad, mm -hmm. I was really big for me. And so I actually did derail, if you want to say in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I think I have a really strong foundation uh, that actually kept me from, you know, turning to substance abuse, uh, which you see often young people do to try and um, deal with these really hard times. Um, but yes, I do credit uh, my family and really good friends mm -hmm. for helping me to stay on the right track. And that's really important that um, people have a strong foundation. And, you know, I do understand that some uh, young people don't have, you know, their parents maybe, or even a family unit. But I think um, that's where the church comes in and plays a really big role in helping them have that community that's really strong in keeping them um, on the right path. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's very good for our, our young ladies and girls and young women to hear. And I think yeah. that hearing that aside from the church, you had a very good family support and clearly you were kept on the path and you worked towards your leadership. So people listening may say, oh yeah, good for you. You had that support. It was open and close inverted commas, easy for you. But what yeah. would you say to a young woman or a girl who never had those privileges, who never had that kind of support? How does such a person advance towards a leadership role? Yeah. I think it's really important to really know yourself. You really need to dig in deep and really, um, really know who it is that you are and really understand what it is that you believe to be right. Um, if you are spiritual at all, that really does help. Um, having that faith in God is very helpful and especially in these trying times. But yes, to any young person, I know uh, a lot of young people don't have that support system and family um, unit. And so it is really up to them to really uh, look into themselves to find what it is that they want to do and stay strong in that. 
um, and to never waver from what they want out of life and believe to be um, true. So that is my advice. And I know it's hard, it's, it's very difficult, um, but um, it is always worth it in the long run. They stay true to themselves. But aside from that, um, I think uh, in the Western world, we, we don't credit community as much. Community is very important um, in trying to you know, um, develop yourself especially in leadership, you really do need a community around you. So even if that is one or two other people, that is very helpful and really needed um, for any young person trying to pursue. And um, one thing I found really helpful for me, and I think a lot of young girls especially need to know this, when you reach out to other women who are in these positions that you aspire to be in, they're very actually willing to help you. Um, I, I think there's an intimidation there that these women or these men uh, don't have the time for you or, you know, they don't care to help you. You'd be surprised how many of these people actually really want to help you because I think a lot of these leaders see themselves in you, mm -hmm. especially if you're brave enough to go and ask them for help and their personal help and guidance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely help you. I myself have received a lot of that type of help. And yeah, it's thanks to these women and men um, that I've been able to advance some of the work that I've been wanting to do. Very good. Well, thank you very much for saying that because I, I yeah. think that a lot of young people need to know that they can reach out and that the people yes. who seem so formidable to them are actually yes. very willing and, 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 and want yes. to <laughs> and support them. Thank you for saying Absolutely. that. You mm -hmm. know, I, I like to listen to comedians I like to listen to international comedians because I like a good old tickle tickle laugh, yes. But more than that, I like to listen to them because they give me a sense of their reality. Sometimes you understand about community and so on. Sometimes it's all fictitious, but sometimes I think it, it points to certain things. And yes. so as they say, art imitates life. So I want to talk to you about Jonah from Tonga. He's one of the comedians that I, I, I listen to sometimes, I follow sometimes. And in one of his skits, he makes an indictable charge on his father. And this caused the school to call this father in to speak to him about this very serious matter. And what happened was the father then started to curse the teachers and threaten them. And of course we had a good old laugh, but then I said to myself, hmm, what is this saying? Is the home the primary source of leadership training? Yes. Yes. Um, it's funny that you actually referenced Jonah from Tonga. Um, it's well known around this region to be quite a racist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a racist um, comedy. I, ha I, I have met Chris Lillian. He's, you know, he's well intended. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of your question, yes, I do believe the home is the um, you know starting point of where one is you know taught how to lead, mm -hmm. and that's the thing about leadership. I think people think um, only certain people can lead, only certain um, uh, members of you know society from different families are the ones who have the right to lead, and I think that's wrong. Everyone has that right to lead, um, but leadership is a really hard feat. Um, and it's those who persevere and really believe in themselves that um, usually go forward. That's right. Uh, but, yeah. yeah. And that's why the family unit is so important because that's the foundation. And here in Tonga, uh, we don't, um, the smallest unit in Tonga isn't the individual, it's the, mm -hmm. family. It's the family. And so, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the family does play the, a, a big role in defining that person's um, path, mm -hmm. if it's going to be in leadership or not. I believe so. Well, I'm so glad that I mentioned Jonah from Tongo because yes, I recognize what you said, but I think that yeah. a lot of comedians. <laughs> and I'm not sure that yes. all the comedians who make racist jokes are racist themselves, but because yes. it sells, they yes. do it. So yes. yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying <laughs> that. Um, you know, you're talking about leadership. And, yes. and pardon me for, 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 for harping on the fact that I am so impressed with you being a young person. Leadership mm -hmm. is, 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 is service, okay? It's a calling. 
how do you inspire, and, and because you are working with a lot of young people, how do you inspire others to take this path? You have your reasons, you have your strength, you have your family background, you have, you have values for, from your community, but how do you, what do you say to others, young girls, young women, to, to pursue a leadership path? Yeah, I think um, young women need to really define, like, again, it's about their own definition of leadership and want, knowing what it is that they want to do. I personally believe everyone's purpose, no matter what background or walk of life, every single person's purpose on this earth is to serve others, is to help. Um, how we do it, though, is different. Uh, you'll do it in different ways. I'll do it in my own way. So that's what makes our own journey in life special. And so I, I'd encourage a lot of young girls first to realize this um, and find what it is that they are really good at. Uh, um, whether it be speaking, even whether it's hairdressing, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Mm. Whatever they're talented in and what they are really passionate about, what wakes them up in the morning is what they should really focus on. Um, so yes, I'd encourage young girls to focus on the, what they are good at um, and honing that into how they can help others through that. Through that, right. And that actually then naturally leads you to become a leader within that um, space. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, no, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it chimes very much with something someone else says, which, which pretty much talks about leading from where you are. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's exactly it. So I think um, even sing, young single mothers, I think they're some of the best leaders there are. Um, they don't, they feel, some of them I've spoken to feel like, oh, but I'm not in politics or I'm not in an office every day. It's like, you're raising a child. Yes. That's huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're nurturing the future. That's, um, that is, you know, that's um, great. Um, and, you know, really hard work as well. So that in itself is leadership. Mothers are the best leaders, I think. And so um, knowing how it is that you can help nurture that child into the best person they can be, that's leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's in keeping with what you said just a little while ago with, with leadership starting in the family environment. Because if children see leadership in motion, it is something they want to pursue. Yeah. And it is something they want to do. Now, there's a question that I ask all of the older ladies that I interview. And I know that generations past us, boomers, we own our generation, we're boomers. Yeah. Generations <laughs> past us, you all, you are known for integrating life with work. With all of these things that you do, you, you do things that are very involved with people, very demanding, I gather, emotionally and otherwise. I would like you to tell our listening women and girls what you do in your downtime. Um, I spend a lot of time in nature. Um, I love the ocean. I love being active. And so anywhere that's quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually personally quite introverted as well. And so when I recharge, I, I need to be by myself for lengthy periods so I can be recharged and ready to come back into um, the public. Um, but yes, I love being in nature. The ocean is what has it for me though. I'm a true Islander. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, yes. That's where I'm most at peace. So yes, if you follow me on my personal Instagram, you'll see that I'm at the beach at any opportunity um, possible because okay. it's just where I'm most um, zen. Right. That's great. That's yeah. great for, for, for our young sister here, especially that it is okay to take time to be alone. Yes. Yes. It's so needed. And that's something that I've personally been working really hard on. Um, it's hard to realize, especially when you're so ambitious and you want to do every single project that comes your way or you want to do and you have the opportunity to, but um, prioritizing yourself is what I've really focused on more recently and I can't stress enough how needed it is, especially if you want to pursue leadership. <laughs>
Before we went to break, you were sharing your life work integration and you explained that you, your Zen, you find your Zen when you were in that little alone space from time to time. But you know what I'd like you to tell our young girls and women who are looking towards getting into the work world, get into leadership roles, explain what discipline it takes to be balanced like that. Yeah. You know, so for many of us who start work, we just go, 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 go. It needs a kind of discipline to say, here's the time to look at me. Tell us. So I think um, it's really important for everyone um, to really define what it is that your purpose is or your mission. I believe everyone's purpose is to help others, but your mission is what makes it unique to you and what it is that you can contribute. And so once you've got that clarified, it doesn't really matter what you dabble into. It, it'll always come back to that one thing. And I say this because that helps you then prioritize. So you know what to stick to and you know what to say no to. It's not a bad thing to say no. And I think girls, especially, we need to keep that in mind. I, for too long, um, kept saying yes, yes to every opportunity. And it was great, but it took me away from what it is that my purpose is. So don't be afraid to say no. Um, and once you prioritize and are able to you know, know how to draw boundaries in a friendly way and know how to say no, we're then able to prioritize time for ourselves. Yeah. It is hard. I'm still working on it like a lot and every day, <laughs> um, but it's needed. And you, know, you see the benefit of it. So when you're at your best, you're then able to give your best. So it, um, it has a good effect and we need to stick to that. So I think once you're able to prioritize, you'll know how to um, then be balanced in everything it is that you do with your personal life and professional life. Well, let me tell you a little secret. That's a message for not just the young girls, our primary audience. I think all yes. women. Yes, um, I agree with that. The need to apply that. You know, when we, started, when we started speaking, when you were telling us what you do, you talked about um, the, the people you helped to get a voice, to get their voice. And you mentioned particularly, you mentioned the LGBT um, community. And uh, that brings me to something that I wanted to ask you, particularly because of the kind of work I noticed that you do and the kind of very outgoing person you are. Right now, sexual identity is more liberally spoken of than perhaps in, in years gone by. And we have people who are selecting an identity other than their birth gender or birth sex. And what I want to ask you, is this a demonstration of leadership qualities in the individual or is it just a thing of the 21st century? Um, I think it's both. It's not a thing. I think it's a thing that started in the 21st century. But mm -hmm. I also do believe that, yes, it is leadership for that individual because they're really understanding who it is that they are. And now in this time, um, thank goodness, they have the ability to say so. Um, in the past, you know, individuals haven't had that freedom because they were punished. Um, we have a more understanding society now, which is awesome, because I think that's what advocates and activists have been working so hard for. And now we've reached this place where um, young LGBT members feel comfortable to say that even in a country like Tonga, who is very strictly Christian and isn't very uh, friendly towards the LGBT community. But um, yeah, I think I think it's it's definitely a trait of leadership because once you know yourself, that's the start to leadership. Yes, that's great. Yeah. That is very good to hear. Explain to our listeners what is values-based leadership. Um, in my opinion, values-based leadership is one who leads from their values and not their egos. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so in Tonga, we had our Tongan values and it's called the Gave, Gave Gola. So our five golden values all stand as pillars on the foundation of love. And most Tongan... Gave Gola? Uh, yes. Right. So right. yes, uh, Gave Gola is uh, our Tongan values. And this is something that um, was established by our ancestry. It's just in our culture and something that our leaders often refer back to when they're pushing out initiatives or, you know, leading their communities. And um, when you lead from these places, it is more effective because when you lead from your values, it concerns all. Um, so it's important that we have more values-based leaders. And it's something I think that women are naturally able to do. <laughs> okay. Great. Yes. Yes. It's great. Um, 
You work with uh, youth across the Commonwealth, so I know that you're aware that a lot of our young people are disillusioned for one reason or another, not the least of which is the lack of opportunity and poverty and lack of recognition, which is something that you work towards improving for them. But would you say that it is possible for one to motivate oneself from a position of display, despair to a path of leadership? If it's one's own responsibility? Not, not so much their responsibility, and that we'll come to just now. But I just want to, is it possible for somebody, a young person who is in a state of despair, can, can such a person raise themselves up? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I know many young people who have lost parents, both parents, and um, have ended up being the only female in their own, in their constituent uh, to voice youth. Um, that's a young woman that I mentored actually was in that position. She lost her parents um, within a few months um, and she, all her siblings um, are married and have their own family. So she was really quite alone. And her, she is now the representative of their youth within their constituent in an all male uh, room most of the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so she was in a total place of despair, but she kept persevering because she believed that there was something more that she had to do. Mm. Um, it is hard though, like I mentioned before, but it, it, it doesn't matter with leadership, where you come from, what walk of life, you always have that opportunity to transform the situation that you're in into something good and into something more powerful and into leadership. Um, how that happens will vary uh, depending on your own situation, but it really does start from yourself first and your belief in yourself. Believe in yourself. And this is the theme that's been running through all of your answers so far, all, yep. of, your, all, of, all, of, all of your comments. Uh, you know, many high achieving women like yourself are labeled as having imposter syndrome especially when they are growing up the ranks. And sometimes imposter syndrome takes hold and it stays. How would you help a young woman to not embrace this? Yes, that is very true. I don't think it's something that you can completely avoid ever, but um, it's something that I think, especially as women, when we have these very unique opportunities to sit at tables where mostly men sit at, um, it is very important for us to come back and remember how important it is for us to represent. And so when I think we remember that we, we are representing more women, we have that ability to kind of let go of our own personal thoughts. It's not about us anymore. It's actually about a wider community. And when you're able to keep that in mind all the time, um, you're able to then uh, be proactive in these uh, conversations and at these tables as well. Um, it's something I have to often remember. But the other thing as well is um, we, we also need to remember our ancestors, you know, your grandparents, even your great grandparents, they worked really hard. And the reason why you're in these places of, you know, um, influence or power, uh, even if you're by yourself, it's because they worked hard for it too. So, you know, you owe that, you owe it to them as well to say thanks. And I'm going to represent you as well as the communities that you come from. So, yeah. I'm very glad that you made reference to our ancestors. Yeah, because, it's really important that we remember them. <laughs> yeah. In this tidal wave of growth and development, you know, cultural traditions are set aside sometimes sadly to make way for modernity. Do you feel that, given what you've just said, that young girls and women can learn about leadership from traditional values and practices that we have pushed aside? And should they be brought back to the fore? Absolutely, they really should. Um, these practices were put in place by people who were successful in what they did. Our ancestors, I'll speak partic um, specifically to Tonga. Our ancestors were very successful. They were very powerful people and they took over the whole Pacific region at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so it shows that what they were doing and what they believed in was right. Um, but aside from that, our value, our traditional and our traditional beliefs and our culture, when you really look into it properly, they actually are deeply rooted into what it is that we truly need in our society. Um, you know, just for example, with the LGBT community, prior to our Western influence, we were very welcoming. We actually um, considered and um, recognized a third gender. 
now we're being told to recognize it as <laughs> as something um, important. And so this is what I mean in that a lot of the time when you look into our culture and everything, these uh, these ways are very helpful to us in navigating forward in the right way. And I don't think um, I think we have more solutions for the problems that we face when we look back into our traditional um, practices than we do issues. And I think a lot of the time when there's issues, it's a misunderstanding of our traditional, our traditions and our culture. Because all for us in Tonga, all our uh, traditions and cultures are rooted on love, offer. Oh yes. So if it's rooted from there, you, I don't believe you can go wrong. Can go wrong. Can go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you said to me in a different conversation, you said that leadership is to be responsible and having the right to exercise leadership is something for all. I understand you to be saying in that, that leadership and responsibility are synonymous. Yet, I'm not sure that all of the young people, at least all of the young people that I encounter, or some of the young people that I encounter, I should say, I'm not sure that they get this. Could you explain to your fellow young woman how to harness the rights to lead and to exercise the responsibility when doing so? Sure. Um, so yes, I believe to lead, um, it requires you to be responsible because when, when you're on top, you're actually then in charge of others. And thus that is a responsibility that comes you otherwise then would not be a leader. So these are responsibilities that you need to recognize and acknowledge. So if you're going to lead, like I said, as a single young mother, you're responsible for that child. There are many responsibilities under that. To take that further out into the community, you're then responsible for more, more people, more people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different needs. And so there are many more responsibilities with that. And so leadership isn't just this, you know, fancy place that you're in meeting, you know, rubbing elbows with high and deep, um, uh, powerful people. It's, it's, a res it's service. And so with service, there is huge responsibilities. But in terms of the rights to lead, every single individual on this planet has the right to lead. And that's what I mentioned before. It, it's a really hard feat because, you know, not many people want to serve a wider community outside of their family because there's you know some people might feel like they have imposter syndrome like who am I to lead in this community I don't have what it takes um or um they they just don't want to um mm -hmm. but yes so it to lead has responsibilities that come with that you have to be responsible otherwise you wouldn't be a leader anyway um, but um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Yes, it, it certainly does. It certainly does. And it gives our listeners, gives me, and I'm sure our listeners, a lot to think about as it relates to leadership and respond, the responsibility that comes with leadership. You know, back on the issue of tradition, and I'm really very happy that you, you, you've said what you said with regard to how valuable the, the culture and the tradition is. And I'm respectful of all the diverse cultures we have across the Commonwealth, across the world. But yes. we are aware that there are in, still in some cultures a demand for young girls to be deprived of education, or not, I shouldn't say deprived, not allowed to further their education. Sometimes they're only allowed to go as far as it is mandatory by the state and then they are taken away from education because they are girls. And some of them are even forced into situations of marriage while they're still pretty much children. If the parents of such girls were listening to us today, what would you say to them to help to dissuade them from this, bearing in mind that we respect their culture? Mm. Um, I think we have that problem across the board. You know, I, there's certainly certain uh, cases here in Tonga that are similar where parents uh, will marry their young girl early in life um, for opportunities. And I think that's the key word here that we're looking at. It's for opportunities to further themselves as an individual and be taken care of and be okay. And I think what parents, more, more parents need to understand 
um, who believe that you know giving them uh, giving young women off to marriage um, is that there are many opportunities now. Women um, can actually lead in different sectors and different fields, and there's many women already doing that to prove. So it's not hard anymore to prove to um, parents that a woman can lead in this particular field to show them that their young girl can actually do that as well. And there are so many opportunities with scholarships that the excuses then um, they can't afford um, it financially. Um, mm -hmm. So there's many opportunities. And I think just explaining to parents the myriad of, of opportunities available now to their young girls to have a good life, to live safely um, and to um, live successfully as well and to help them as a family unit um, then I think parents will be more understanding that young, their young girls don't actually have to marry only to mm. have that life yeah. um, girl, many girls are single still um, into their late 30s and they're very successful helping their families and leading the kind of life that their parents um, aspire them to have and in terms of having children yes that's some that's you know the biggest blessing a woman can have Yes. That can come later, but how liberating it is, I think we can explain to these parents how liberating it is for a girl to actually be able to choose a partner um, that they are able to have that child with. So, yeah, I think it's a matter of explaining opportunities. Um, we're way beyond the times of when it was just men that had opportunities to, you know, um, give to a family and have successful careers. Many women are doing it now, so it's a very easy um time now and we need to take advantage of that yes you know uh you've said you've touched on something that is perhaps at the core of all of this and it is being able to look after the parents they think that if this girl again makes a good marriage then they'll be looked after you know the, the bride price and this kind of thing so i think you have given us a lot to, to chew on that. that, that's an excellent response. You know, Elizabeth, we are living in different parts of the world, of this wonderful world that we live in. As a matter of fact, it is so different. It is dinner time for me now and it's lunchtime for you. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but something that we've got very much in common is that we are in regions that are destined to suffer most yes. from climate change. Do you see opportunities for young women to take leadership in addressing the issues of climate and climate change? Absolutely. Um, I think, as we both know, being in these sorts of regions, um, when you enter into cyclone season, for an example, which we are in right now in Tonga, when cyclones hit, it's mostly women who are in charge of looking after the families and ensuring um, that their, you know, the home is taken care of during these times. And so there is a huge opportunity for a lot of young women to look into this, um, look into this, to lead within. We're already naturally leading, um, but I think we are able to now take a little bit further um, and look into climate change from a more scientific um, <laughs> angle. And yes, if more young women looked into this side of things, they could help um, sustain our countries and our islands better. Uh, we do that naturally already. We can see that when we have, you know, disaster, storms and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we need to see more leadership in terms of um, the education and initiatives from the government. Um, yeah. Maybe. We're actually seeing a lot of, fe mostly females um, in Tonga right now, I have to say, are behind running um, initiatives for climate change. So mm -hmm. that's, that's good. <laughs> Maybe we, should have had, maybe we should have had this meeting a little earlier so we could have sent a message to COP. I know. Yes, <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, I <laughs> COP is a different story. I, I'm not very pleased with the outcome, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, with more young women like Brianna Fruin from Samoa, um, we should be heading in the right direction, hopefully. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Elizabeth? You are a fascinating young lady. Where to next? What can the world expect from Elizabeth Kite next? Um, so you mentioned that um, I am with the Commonwealth Youth mm -hmm. Council. Mm -hmm. I'm actually exiting now oh. and there's a new incoming. Um, we have taken this role on for an extra year due to COVID. Um, but with that, it's given me free time to actually pursue more of uh, 
personal goals it is that I've been wanting to do. So um, I'll be focused a little bit more on the my business that I registered this year. And that's what I'm really excited to be pursuing next year because it's helping a wider community and especially talented young women and also people from the LGBT community. Uh, so I can say that for now. Thank you, Elizabeth. This has been a very enlightening conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for your time, man. <laughs> Today, we have been talking with a young, eloquent, visionary leader from the Commonwealth a role model for her contemporaries and for generations to come. She is Ms. Elizabeth Kite, the founding CEO of Take the Lead, Tonga. I thank you. Thank you, Malo and Malo. <laughs>